uh, only just realised that I've been doing this for such a long time when uh, somebody who I started off climbing sent me a message saying it's 50 years since we did this climb um, should we do a, an anniversary of it so and that was when I got my PhD this was an undergraduate so I thought I'd uh, try and explain basically what had happened over the years in the beginning everything was very very crude indeed and it's a miracle that very much was done so um, let's just think what has changed uh, in the 19 uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, the only detector that was around was the photographic film. And everything was everything that was recorded uh, was done by photographic uh, emulsions, which you then had to process and all sorts of things and analyze them. Um, spectroscopy, when uh, Edwin Hubble measured um, the redshift of the galaxies, he used an enormous spectrograph, which had two great big prisms in it, and he took often took several days of exposure to get, actually get a, um, a spectrum. And that's because the, um, uh, the prisms aren't very efficient and also the, he was using a photographic film. Um, when I started uh, doing astronomy, all the telescopes were entirely manually controlled. You had a, a telescope which could move in any direction. They were nearly always equatorial telescopes, so one axis was parallel to the Earth's axis. And in principle, all you had to do for it to track an object was to turn the telescope in, this, in the opposite direction to the Earth was rotating at the same speed, so once every sidereal day. Um, and uh, the telescope had no computer control on it. It had big setting circles. And you'd actually view through a, a telescope to see the setting circles and move the telescope manually until you got it in the right place. Um, <clears throat> since then, <clears throat> we have obviously computer-controlled telescopes and even robotic telescopes. <clears throat> um, computers were um, very crude indeed. Um, the first computer I ever used was the, the Atlas machine, which um, had 64K of memory and took two whole rooms of an electrical engineering building. Uh, obviously, lots have changed since then. The other thing that's changed, of course, is uh, the way we communicate with each other. Uh, there's the internet, that wasn't around. Word processing wasn't even around. Um, and of course, the other thing is that um, at the time, all the telescopes were ground-based. Since then, we've obviously had uh, satellite uh, ones and even deep sky missions. So, <clears throat> um, I'm going to explain uh, how, how, how it worked from my point of view, because from as a PhD student in 1972 or something like that, <clears throat> I went to uh, Manchester and uh, I was taken by my supervisor to Jodrell Bank uh, on the second day and we met these radio astronomers and they basically produced a map of the sky at radio wavelengths and you could see along the plane of the ga galaxy uh, high radio emission but there were these big loops of radio emission sticking out, there were four loops and when they looked at the sky atlas, they couldn't see anything. So what on earth is, what are these loops? Um, and I was, my, part of my, my PhD was to look and find out what, what was going on. So um, the idea was that maybe these were large supernova remnants, which were very close to the Earth, so they had a large angular size. Um, and I was set the job of seeing if I could find any um, emission from the, the gas. The gas is nearly all hydrogen. And the, big, the most um, prominent spectral line is H alpha, which is in the red. So I was set to see if I could discover any H alpha emission. And when I did actually find some, I was asked to find the speed at which it was moving, to see whether it was moving gas from a supernova or whether it's something else. Um, so uh, here's me at the Picture Media Observatory. Uh, this is in the Pyrenees. Uh, this, isn't the telescope, this isn't what I was using to be doing my PhD. It was a 24-inch refractor, so 60 inches focal length. Um, it's, it's the only picture I've got of me actually at the observatory. And this was actually used, this is before the moon landing. Manchester University had a contract with the US Air Force to map the moon to find the most likely um, landing spot. So we had a thing called the data camera, which was about had a 12-inch film, and we'd take lots of pictures of the, of the moon under very good conditions, because the seeing was very good. And the, those uh, films were sent to the US Air Force, and then they decided where they were going to land. Um, so, uh, 
to the observations I was making, which I was making, um, I can't even point on here, but is there a pointer? I should have thought of that before. No. Anyhow, well, this is a, basically this is a picture that uh, I wasn't. Uh, this is a picture of the top of the uh, Peter Midi. You can see there's a terrace on the front of there, and I had a, uh, a little equatorial mount, uh, which was not in a dome or anything like that. It was just sat outside, so you had to be well wrapped up when you did any observing. And uh, my supervisor said, "We've got this mount, and we've been taking these pictures, and the." Uh, the images aren't very good, they're not very circular, and uh, uh, there's some, there seem to be some trails. And it, it turned out that my supervisor didn't know an awful lot about um, aligning telescope mounts, and he, um, he assumed when he, he set the telescope, the mount due south, he'd assumed that, that when the, the sun was due south, that was at noon every day. But of course it's not, depending on your, last, your longitude. and uh, because it's the equation of time, so it varies by up to half an hour. So if they'd done it at a time when it wasn't due south, the mount wouldn't have been pointing north. So that was the first thing. The other thing was the angle was wrong as well, because he'd used a map which the French had, had produced, which used, um, had used grads instead of degrees. And there's a hundred grads in a right angle. So the latitude was wrong as well. Uh, we fixed that, and then the other thing we found was that the images weren't terribly well focused and we had a Schmidt camera which was made out of brass and you focus and you took it outside in the cold and of course the dimensions changed so I'm, I made a new uh, Schmidt camera which had uh, temperature compensation you had a, an in-bar rod and a brass rod and the in-bar rod you make it so that the expansion one is compensated by the other so uh, when that was done we actually got some quite nice results so this is some of the pictures I took um, of some of the nebulosity. This is taken through a, a, an H-alpha filter. Well, the thing to say about that is that um, uh, stars are usually quite big black bodies, something like that, uh, whereas uh, the hydrogen just comes out in uh, H-alpha and H-beta. So what you do is you put a filter on which just lets the H-alpha through. So it, it cuts down, it basically cuts down all the starlight and you just see the gas. This is a theme you'll see later as well. Um, so we discovered these uh, nebulosities, uh, and the question was, were they just ordinary H2 regions in star formation areas where the, the stars had formed and were just illuminating the gas by ultraviolet light and just making them uh, glow? Or was it actually a supernova which had gone off some time ago and was pushing out into the interstellar medium? Uh, and the only way you could find out that was by measuring the velocity. Now, if you think about using a spectrograph to do that, you have a tiny little slit, uh, and you've got a, a big thing across the... This is, these are six degrees, uh, perhaps ten degrees square, circular rod. So you've got a large area of sky. So if you try to point a slit on a telescope, you only see a very tiny bit. So the answer was to use something else, and we used a fabri Perot interferometer. Um, you perhaps come across fabric pairing performances. It's two glass plates, uh, highly reflective, and but, um, you get fringes formed at infinity. And these fringes, um, it's arranged so that the separation, depending on the separation of the plates, uh, in this case the separation was six angstroms, which is 0 0.6 of a nanometer, which corresponds to 300 kilometers a second. So if you illuminated this with a hydrogen lamp, you see six, you see the nice circular images from the lamp. If you point it at a nebula, and you can see here there's the, the North American nebula you might be able to recognize, these, the, the position of these rings changes depending on the velocity. So it allows you to measure the expansion velocity. Uh, and that worked, and we actually found that the, uh, the, the uh, gas was moving at about 20 to 30 kilometers a second, which might have been, basically supernova go off in a very big bang and they shoot out at thousands of kilometers a second, then they sweep up the interstellar medium and they slow down. Um, so it could be an old supernova, but it could have also been some kind of wind-driven shell which we didn't even know about in those days. So the point is you've, you've got the, uh, the technology here is you have a, um, a mount which is not um, guided, it's just done by dead, just a motor tracking it, the, the rotation of the Earth, 
and you've used a photographic film which is like 1% quantum efficiency, so very low tech. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, yeah, looking at uh, uh, photographic emotions, depending on where you, who you talk to and what you believe, photographic film is like 1 or 2% efficient. Um, some of the best efficiencies of some of these photographic plates was obtained by doing weird things to the plates, like baking them or soaking them in hydrogen, uh, all sounding very dangerous, which of course it was. Um, the reason for that was the photographic plate was made so that when they put it in the cupboard, it didn't, um, it didn't go off very quickly. So they put preservative agents in. So basically, the, the photographic emulsion is sodium, uh, sorry, uh, silver iodide or silver chloride. And uh, thermal effect can actually knock uh, electrons out of some of these crystals, and the crystals, what happens in a photographic emulsion is a single crystal, if it hit by a photon, the whole crystal goes, goes black when it's developed. And you don't want that to happen while it's sat on the shelf, so they put these chemicals in to stop it happening. Um, but, as I say, by um, uh, soaking in, uh, actually baking the plates, uh, before you expose them, to get rid of some of these chemicals, or even soaking it in, uh, in hydrogen. In fact, some of the uh, exposures which I'll show you later are at the UK Schmidt, which had 14 inch square plates. Uh, you put them into the plate holder, and there was a supply of um, hydrogen. So that while you're exposing the plate, the plate was um, b behind a filter, there was a, a, an air gap, and the air gap was filled with hydrogen to stop the plate going off. So, um, let's see what I've got next. Okay, this is just looking at the different sensitivities of different uh, materials. So, photographic film, 1 or 2%. The photocathode, uh, which is something like cesium iodide or cesium chloride, in a vacuum chamber, is about 20%. And the, the, the most obvious um, application of that is a photomultiplier, which you use in scintillation detectors and all that kind of thing. But basically, they have no positional resolution at all. They just measure the intensity of light by counting the photons. Um, uh, after that, um, even I'd given up doing research by this stage, CCDs came along, which have, as you know, up to about 90% quantum efficiency. So uh, let's go to the next example. This is using uh, a photographic plate with a telescope that can track. So the first one wasn't tracking at all. This is the UK Schmidt telescope in Australia. Um, years ago, you've probably seen pictures of um, Edwin Hubble standing by the, uh, the Palomar uh, Schmidt telescope. This is a copy of it. And basically, Mount Palomar took a picture of the whole of the, the northern sky on plates which were um, uh, six inches, sorry, six degrees square um, on 14 inch plates like that. This is one taken in Australia. But basically there was a sky survey done by Mount Palomar and you could get a copy of it on photographic prints. In fact, we did actually buy a copy of it. So this is the um, equivalent telescope in Australia, um, built by the UK, it's called the UK Schmidt Telescope. Um, and uh, uh, there's a picture of me uh, setting up the UK Schmidt Telescope and a picture of Edwin Hubble on the northern version of it. Uh, basically what happened was we were interested in seeing what the southern sky looked like in H alpha to look for nebulosities, H2 regions, supernova remnants, all of that kind of thing. And we applied for telescope time on the UK Schmidt, uh, but the, uh, the people who built the telescope wanted to do a southern hemisphere survey, not in the red, but just for everybody else. Anyhow, um, things changed. Um, the UK Schmidt was supposed to take a sky survey and they said we couldn't have it. We requested time to do it. And anyhow, the plates came from Kodak one month and uh, they didn't work at all. So they, they had a telescope which uh, could be used, but they it couldn't use it to do the survey. Uh, so basically what happened is I got a telex. Um, you've never seen a telex before. It's a piece of paper on a pellet, on a pellet printer. Um, this is before um, the internet, obviously, saying, um, could I use a month on the UK Schmidt Telescope? And that was, of course, 
a godsend for me as just a, a new PhD person. Um, so I was sent out to Australia and uh, basically we, we decided to make a filter uh, for this telescope and we would already built it before we were given the time. So um, my supervisor designed this filter. In those days, making interference filters which have very narrow bands, uh, you know, a few, um, perhaps 100 angstroms, which is 10 nanometers, um, was quite difficult. So you could only make small ones. So what we actually did was to make a mosaic of, I think it was 16 of these pieces up into a 14 inch square plate. Uh, and I took that out um, to Australia uh, with some difficulty getting through customs. And this is me inside the, um, the Schmidt telescope fitting the, uh, uh, the filter. Now, um, the UK, well, all the Schmidt telescopes are about f2.5. Um, f2.5. So anybody who's pho photographically minded knows that's quite a fast focal ratio. So it turns out with a, an ordinary filter, a few hundred um, nanometers wide, if you took a 20 minute exposure, the sky would blacken the plate. So by taking longer exposures, you didn't get any more because uh, that, you got down to the sky brightness. So the longest exposure that I'd ever taken um, on the Schmidt was about 20, 25 minutes. I went out and the first exposure I took was for five hours. Um, and that's the result. This is the Vela supernova remnants, which I was interested in. Um, I almost dropped the plate when I took it out of the developer. Basically, these plates are um, a millimetre thick, 14 inches square. They go in the telescope. The Schmidt telescope has got a, a spherical surface. The Schmidt telescope got a funny uh, corrector plate, something like that. Um, and you have a big spherical mirror, and the focus is halfway here, and it's a curved surface. It has a curved plate. So the plate is actually bent inside the telescope to a radius of six feet. Sometimes it cracks and makes a terrible mess, but generally not. So basically, I exposed this for five hours, put it in the developer that had a tank with a gallon of developer in and a machine that flushed it back. And I took it out and I looked at it and thought, my goodness, um, nobody has ever seen that before. Um, so it's uh, quite exciting, really. Um, you can see on here, you can see the shadows of the mosaic. Um, and you can see, well, there's just basically this, uh, 100 times more material than anybody had ever seen before. Now this caused a little bit of mayhem uh, at the observatory because the UK Schmidt and the Anglo-Australian Observatory are on the same site and the Mount Stromlo Observatory is there as well, so there's quite a lot of astronomers. Um, and when I took that, um, I told them what I'd done and they came across like bees to look at what had been done. And every morning when I'd, I'd work all night, go to bed, get up for breakfast, they'd be banging on my door saying, what did you do last night? Which was you know, quite exciting really. So, um, uh, this didn't bring me fame or fortune, the next one probably did. Um, so, uh, as I say, this is a uh, supernova, and you can see the filaments, it's, um, it's lots of intersecting bubbles. This is uh, a supernova went off, forgotten how many years ago, uh, 50,000 years ago, I think. Uh, and the, the star exploded, and the outer shell, the outer layer of the star, uh, went out into space at enormous speed, um, tens of thousands of kilometres a second. And it, it's what's called the snowplow effect. The, um, the shock moves out, and the interstellar medium, which is gas and dust and things like that, is quite uneven. And if the density is quite low, it blows out quite quickly. If the density is quite high, it slows down. And you can see all of these sort of shell-like structures as the, as the supernova is going out. It also left... Um, uh, a super, it left a, a pulsar at the centre, uh, which I'll mention a bit more later. Um, the next thing I did was to have a look at the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and that, uh, well, was just amazing. There's uh, hundreds of new objects there. Um, so I got the job of measuring all of these. Uh, quite a few of them were already known. Um, because they'd been observed at the Ratcliffe Observatory in, in South, South Africa. But I was given the job of cataloguing all of these objects. Uh, and so I, basically you've got a plate 
depending on where you are on the sky, um, if you lines of right ascension do something like that, uh, and uh, declination something like this, you've got a plate which looks like that. So you've got these are celestial coordinates, and then you've got the x y coordinates, and the transformation of one to the other is called doing a plate solution. So basically, what you do is you look at the number of stars whose position you know, and then you can work out from that uh, how to transform the xy coordinates into right ascension and declination. Um, so this is the xy measuring machine that I used. Um, it wouldn't take a whole 14-inch um, plate. Um, so I then had to make copies of the plate onto a 10 by 10 plate which I could actually measure. Um, so I then sat in this measuring room for many long hours, uh, putting the cross wires on the centre of each of the nebulae which we found, pressing the button, and this, this paper tape would then punch out the XY coordinates. Um, uh, this was then processed on an Atlas machine, which was described as one of the, the world's first supercomputers. Um, Two whole project energy in the building. The important thing was this was before integrated circuits. It had discrete components, so it had transistors in it, germanium transistors. Um, and that's a picture of the Atlas computer uh, with rows and rows of these. I used to have a board which I should have kept, which had was uh, had the components on for an Atlas machine. And there's the code on the right hand side that I wrote. Uh, to convert the coordinates from x, y into uh, r, a, and x. It's interest, it's, it, it looks a lot easier than some of the modern languages, to be honest. No punctuation for a start. Um, so, um, the interesting thing about the Atlas computer was that um, you got, um, you, you put in your job once a day, so you typed out the paper tape, you took it across the, the room to the computer center, and then you went the next morning to get a sheet of line printer which said syntax error because you'd misspelled something. <laughs> so the, um, it was a very slow process, and it made you very careful that you got everything right. Um, so, uh, however, one of the objects has become quite famous recently. Uh, we pu basically published this um, Catalogue, Davies, Elliot, and Meburn. Um, Davies was the Jodler man, um, Meburn was my supervisor, uh, but I did the work. Um, and uh, so I noticed this object on the. Uh, uh, which science skill was it? Uh, I haven't put it up. It's the, um, J the James uh, Webb telescope, yeah. Um, and it's the object, it's named uh, DEML. 190, so it's Davies Elliot Meban. L means the large module in the cloud, and it's uh, uh, that's that's the number in the catalogue. So I'm hoping to see some more with my name on it. We'll see. Um, so let's go um, back to how telescopes work and what happened in 1974. Basically, all the telescopes you came across um, were not driven by computers. Um, they were standalone machines with great big setting circles. Some of the setting circles were this sort of diameter, and some of them were sufficiently far away that you needed a telescope to read them. Um, so basically what you did was you wanted to know um, how to point the telescope, and if you know what sidereal time, if you look, um, if you look due south, um, and at about this time of the year, you'll see Orion or something like that. And Orion's about five hours. So this is about five hours, four hours. So basically, sidereal time is, tells you what right ascension is due south at any time. So you had a sidereal clock, which instead of working one, one day being 24 hours, it's 23 hours, 56 minutes. So it compensates for the Earth moving around the sun. So what you did was you went uh, to the observatory clock, you found out what the sidereal time was, and you set uh, that to the zero on the on the right ascension circle, and then you 
you then moved it to whatever right centre you wanted it to be. Um, the same in, in declination, that was much simpler. Um, accuracy, depending on how big the circles were, there were no encoders around. You actually physically looked at a, a big um, a big vernier type of thing. Um, accuracy about five and a half minutes. Lots of opportunities for, mi for mistakes. Um, going back to the, um, the UK Schmidt, as I said, I was given a month's time on uh, the UK Schmidt, which included you know, being there over Christmas. Uh, and on Christmas Eve, I went to the, the director's uh, house in the local village called Kunabarabran and had quite a nice dinner and probably quite a bit of wine, really. Uh, and went back and I took a plate of a, one of the fields I wanted and then only realised afterwards that the display for the um, pointing of the telescope wasn't digital by any means. It was uh, effectively lots of protractors which rotated. So if you actually uh, you wanted to go to minus 10 degrees, this thing would whiz round until you got to minus 10. But I, I'd actually set it at plus 10. Um, so I'd missed the object by 10 de 20 degrees. Um, as far as I know, it's the only entry in the UK Schmidt catalogue which says a mistake. Um, so maybe there's something interesting there, but I, anyhow. Uh, so, uh, basically, before 1974, all the, all the telescopes in the world were just the same. You had setting circles or whatever. So the idea of having a little go-to telescope that you just say, I'd like to see Saturn now, you know, that was miles ahead. Okay, so a number of... Uh, telescopes. At, at one stage, the UK was quite good at making telescopes and made lots of these 74 inch telescopes. Uh, uh, and basically, the telescope at Wash Tills, in fact, was the same kind of mount as an English mount. So you have a, a north and a south pier, which means it's very stable. Uh, and the, the important, you can probably tell that's quite a low latitude because the, the polar axis is pointing at quite, quite low. If, if you get near the equator, it's almost horizontal. So the angle tells you where you are in the world. Um, and the ones I think have got an asterisk on are ones that are actually used. So big workhorse, but they had, um, as I say, no um, automation at all, just they weighed several, well, tens of tons probably. But and as mostly 74 inch uh, mirrors, which is 1.9, 1.9 meters. So, uh, <coughs> get to the next example of how technology changed. I got a job at the Anglo Australian Observatory, which was the first telescope ever to be designed to be computer controlled. So, before they built it, they decided they wanted to have a computer to control everything, uh, and it allowed you to do things that nobody else could do. Um, so, uh, here's a picture of me uh, in younger days. Uh, the telescope, if we go back, you can see uh, right at the top of the uh, telescope is a long tube and uh, what you have there is that the, you have a prime focus. The telescope's got a big mirror here, usually with a hole in it, and the light comes down and would come to a focus somewhere like that. Because the mirror is a hyperbola, you can't just do that, the images would be quite nasty. So you actually have a few lenses there, and then you have a cage, the focal planes there, and you have a cage there, and you have a little man in it, yeah, usually me. Um, and um, backed up with a batch of plates, we used 10-inch plates, so they were that sort of size. The amazing thing about this was, um, you'd go to something like the Sombrero Galaxy, and before you put the plate in, you could actually look down, you could see the Sombrero Galaxy, in all of its glory, it was just phenomenal. Um, and before we had any automation, you would go up there and you stay there um, six or eight hours, as long as you'd last, um, with a batch of plates and uh, you'd even do some guiding sometimes. Uh, so, uh, got the next picture here. Uh, yeah. So you can see um, me sat at the prime focus. There's a little um, thing in the centre which is just do doing the alignment. Uh, there was an auto guider there, and you, but you had to find the star. So you had an X Y movement, and you'd say there's, there's a star at this position, and you wind, and, and then you try and focus the telescope, 
and the telescope was focused by moving the whole of the top end of the telescope. So the whole of this here is on a, on a vernier with motors and mo moves you up and down as well as everything else. <laughs> Anyhow, one night I was doing this and I said, I just cannot focus on this object. It's just, give me another one. So I got another side and was fine. Afterwards, we discovered by chance we were looking at Uranus. <laughs> so what's the chance of that? Very, very small. Um, so I took quite a lot of pictures with that. Um, I don't know if you heard of David Malin. He was the chief photographer there and he and I, well, I was there for two years, took all the prime focus plates. Uh, so you can see the control room. Um, uh, that's uh, there's some TV cameras to look through the telescope, but the uh, the thing that made it special was the fact it was controlled by a computer. Oops, what do I think? Oh, okay, uh, I'm jumping the gun. Okay, <clears throat> okay. So the the point about having a uh, computer is it allows you to make a telescope almost perfect. All telescopes have got imperfections. Um, the R in deck axes may not be exactly at right angles to each other. Um, the other things are things like um, you have the, the um, optical axis might not be at right angles to the, uh, the declination axis. And also you might have things like the polar axis may not be quite in the right place. And basically these are all simple geometric errors which you can measure and correct for. Now, to be able to measure um, the property, you need to know where the telescope is, and that's done by um, an encoder. And this is an example of a, a four-bit binary encoder. Obviously, four-bit binary encoders wouldn't give you very much precision to find out where you are. But say, oh, we've got zero, one, two, three, and basically there are photo cells looking through this little pattern. The pattern rotates uh, on the telescope or through some gears or whatever. Normally. Uh, for instance, Watch Hills, the first telescope we built, had 15-bit um, encoders. So you basically, you get a binary number depending on, on the orientation. Um, basically what you do is you, you get the telescope to look at a star whose position you know exactly. The position of all stars is known very accurately. And then you ask the telescope where it thinks it is. And then you do some modelling which allows you to find out what these errors are. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can also correct for things like the flexing of the tube or gear errors. For instance, at Wash Hills, we had 18-inch uh, uh, worm wheels, actually made in Birmingham. Um, and if the worm isn't, if the worm wheel isn't quite central, say uh, there's the centre. If you actually uh, did the round there, it would rotate in a slightly different position. And therefore you get a periodic error, so it's sometimes ahead of itself, sometimes behind. And you can actually measure that very accurately. The other thing you can do is, when you look at uh, a star in the sky, um, and you see it um, going towards the horizon, if you had an ordinary telescope, as the star gets nearer and nearer the horizon, there's more and more refraction. So the star actually slows down. Yeah? It's like when you see the sun setting, it's actually already set. But it's just because of refraction. So you can actually put a model in which takes into account refraction. The other thing that you can uh, take into account are um, the sets of coordinates which you've come across before right ascension and declination. Um, they often have something like 1950 or 2000. And that's because um, the pull of the, the uh, coordinate system is based on the Earth, and the Earth precesses every 26,000 years. So the coordinate system which you use to measure the position, uh, you have to say when, when you, which year you are using it in, and so that's precession. Um, so you basically, uh, what you do is you, you say what the coordinate system for, for your star is in 1950, and then you work out where it would be for this year, depending on the precession of the Earth. The other thing that happens is you get mutation. Because of the moon, the Earth's axis wobbles a little bit. Um, and the other thing that you, you can correct for is aberration. You remember the aberration of starlight? The, um, the Earth's going round the sun at, whatever it is, 25 kilometres a second. Um, and therefore, if you have to, if by the time the photons have gone down the tube, the back end of the telescope has moved. 
So you have to tilt it slightly. That's 40 arc seconds or something. Um, and you can take all of those into account. And when you do that, um, let's have a look. Oh, that, that's just the explanation of the, the errors uh, and of the telescope mount. Um, no, we're going back. So this is basically this is a control system, an Interdata 70 computer, 64k of memory, took all of those cabinets, and the program that controlled the telescope was in all those boxes of cards. I didn't write it right away, somebody else did. Um, I stole it afterwards, but... Uh, uh, so, and when you don't do that, uh, this is what you can do. This is, this is the program is showing off, really. Um, this, this is a dartboard representation of how good the telescope is at pointing when you've taken into account all the parameters. So if you asked it to go to a star, it would generally hit it within uh, RMS of one, and one arc second. So, all, so if you think how big uh, Jupiter is, it's about 40 arc seconds across, you're pointing to a fraction of the size of Jupiter. You can also do program scans. You can go in, if you can't find something, you can go in a spiral scan from your the point until you find it. Um, so the great thing about this was you could actually point the telescope uh, very accurately, even at objects you couldn't see. So if a radio astronomer says, "I've seen a quasar at this position," and you look at the sky survey, there's nothing there. You can still go there and take a picture. Um, so Here's an example of that. Um, there was, I mentioned pulsars before. There's the first one which was discovered was the Crab Pulsar, uh, which was a supernova in 1054, and that's 33 milliseconds, and that's quite bright, about 16 magnitude. It's something that we could almost, we can do with our telescope. We've just never done it. Uh, and the other one was the, uh, the Puppis supernova, and which is I showed the, the picture of the, the supernova. And, and a more interesting one is the binary pulsar, uh, which is used to test all, test all sorts of gravita uh, 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 well, gravitational experiments. Um, and basically, we had a, ra a radio position, and I took a photograph of the field uh, with the, with the Anglo-Stonian telescope. And this uh, is a fantastic picture, as I say it myself, of, of, the, of the position. And it's somewhere just to the right. I should have put a cross on there. But um, so we actually sat on that uh, field of view all night with a photoelectric photometer, counting the data. And basically, what you do, the pulses come in, uh, and you uh, you phase fold them. You know what the period is. So you add them up in phase. It was 89 milliseconds, I think. And miracles happen. We've discovered it. It's a great big peak. So we drank the champagne. And then somebody who was a bit more careful divided the data in half and found it was only in one half, and then another half. And eventually it turned out that um, somehow um, a meteor had gone down the telescope tube and produced a flash, which had went folded in with the data to produce this um, uh, the detection, which we hadn't found, of course. So um, very disappointing. Uh, no Nobel Prize or anything like that. Um, but uh, it showed the, the, you know, the capability of the telescope. Uh, the interesting thing about this was I, we had some American visitors, and we were talking about the binary pulsar, and I was saying how good my picture was, and he said, well, what about this? And he showed me a picture on a Polaroid, which was probably 20 times better. And what it was, he was in the US military, and before the Hubble Space Telescope was built and launched, the military had 20 Hubble Space Telescopes all pointing down and being able to read you know, documents and all sorts of things. And he turned the telescope round and taken a picture of the binary pulsar field with a, an image, I still haven't got a copy of it, um, wouldn't, wouldn't give me it. So the interesting thing about that was that the military knew how to build these telescopes long before Hubble. Hubble had a problem, if you remember, when it first started. Not the optics, but the, um, the solar panels bent because of a biometal strip, and the, the telescope used to flex, the pointer used to flex. Um, 
the, the, um, the scientists fixed it eventually, but the military had fixed it ten years before, and they didn't tell them. So, so basically, uh, we've now got a computer-controlled telescope, but we're still using the photographic plate. We still haven't got any... Well, we've got photomultipliers for doing the pulse-up, but we've got no imaging devices at all. Um, let's see what we've got next. So, um, <clears throat> before CCDs were around, the only options really were uh, photomultiplier. Basically, these are all based on the photocathode. Um, and you ha have a photomultiplier, which is a single channel, basically, just measures how bright things are. So quite useful for measuring star brightnesses or pulsars or something like that. Uh, but then they started making um, imaging devices. Uh, initially, uh, just an image, uh, a photocathode uh, with an accelerating voltage and a micro window. And you put a piece of photographic emulsion against the micro window and you detected the electrons. So you had this uh, piece of film which detected the electrons. You have a high voltage to get the game. Um, and then other devices came along, uh, things called the Image Photon Counting System, designed by Alex Boxenberg at University College London, where you had a, 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 an image intensifier, or several image intensifiers, all in series, with sufficient gain, so if a single photon was detected at the front end, it produced a big flash of light at the other end, which you could see with a TV camera. Um, and then basically you had some, it was hardwired logic, worked out the center of the position and recorded its position, so it counted one photon at a time. So um, there was noise and things, but it basically just found that one photon. The problem was that the electronics was all hardwired, well, the, the, the centering was all hardwired, and therefore you could only count about one photon per second, so only suitable very faint objects. Um, so, th apart from photographic film, there was the photographic, there was the um, uh, photo, um, photocathode devices, um, but it, there was nothing else apart from that. This is one here, an example. You've probably seen these night sky vision, uh, uh, you know, they're using walls and things. Um, and you have a photocathode and you have a, um, some electron optics. And you have a high voltage and you have a phosphor on the back end and you get an image, which is an inverted image of what's gone on the front. Uh, and they're quite good. You could actually even take, um, of sometimes just re-image that onto a photographic plate or onto a TV camera or something. Um, so they were used quite extensively, um, and I used them for doing things like uh, taking images of supernova remnants or planetary nebula or whatever in a single um, ion. So you put in, look at oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen, and you could actually see the distribution of the gas in that element. So you could find out the ionization structure of, of objects. The other thing uh, I did some of I mentioned about using a fabric pero before. Um, the one I used on with the camera was um, uh, was fixed, and you got rings. But you can actually scan fabric peros by putting a, a gas in them, and uh, the, basically the profile scans in wavelength, and it then draws out a, an intensity curve. And there were some graphs there of some uh, some nebulae. Uh, does it see what they are? No, no it doesn't. Um, Oh yes, O O O three. But yeah, okay. It, basically, it was objects like M M sixteen, M seventeen. So we looked in, the, in those days. People thought a star switches on. There's a lot of gas, and the gas um, heats up. It's ionized, and it just flows away nicely. Um, but we actually, if, if you look at these profiles, you can see lots of high velocity gas. All sorts of weird things were happening that knew, nobody knew about. And this was done. Uh, at Kotomia in Egypt. This one is, in fact, in it was in Pretoria at the time. It's um, now in the South SAO, the South African uh, Astronomical Observatory. In those days, <coughs> uh, no data taking with um, computers. You actually carried out a very large chart recorder, which had a pen and it drew drew the graphs on some paper. The other thing, which is interesting, they have a high voltage power supply, a photomultiplier. We, observed, we had a month observing at the telescope. And one night, nothing. we're getting no data at all, no idea what had happened. 
And one of us went outside and it was cloudy. And we hadn't even thought it might be cloudy because it would just been completely clear for days on end. So the, the bottom picture is SAO in Sutherland, just north of Cape Town. So basically, um, uh, using uh, fabric powers with um, photomultipliers to measure uh, velocities. <coughs> oh, it's another one. This is at the uh, <coughs> uh, the telescope Hirschmann, so the Isaac Newton telescope. Um, the only story to tell you there is that actually you can see the image intensifier in the middle, and there was you can perhaps just about see it a dentist chair for the observer, so you could uh, um, sit there and do whatever you had to do until. One day somebody pressed the button and you got crushed against the back of the telescope so it didn't switch off. Um, yeah, there's another story about accidents. I'll think about that one in a minute. Um, okay, <clears throat> so in 1985, or uh, not all hell was released, but uh, uh, basically CCDs had been invented before that, but they became a possibility. And the CCD works by, it's a piece of silicon. Uh, quite a large piece of silicon, and uh, there are a series of electrodes, usually three electrodes for each pixel. It's actually a solid piece of. Uh, there aren't actually individual pixels there. There's no. There's no cuts in it or anything. It's just um, you've got um, a piece of silicon and you have electrodes there uh, like that. So that's one pixel, say. And then there's another one. So there's an electrode there, electrode there, electrode there. And basically, what you do. Uh, you um, expose it to light, and the light produces lots of electrons, well, different numbers of electrons in each pixel. Uh, and when you finish exposing, what you do is you um, decide you want to move the pixels about. So you start off where you have a high voltage on that electrode, and you gradually ramp it down and put the voltage on the next one. So the charge moves from one electrode to another. And then you ramp it down on that one and up onto the next one. So basically, by changing the voltages on the electrodes on the back of the uh, silicon, you can move charge about. So what you do is, um, there's an output register here, which looks a bit like the rest of it. So what you do is, you, you, you uh, move the whole of the image down one row. So the bottom row of pixels all goes into this output register. And then one at a time, you move them out. So you've got an amount of charge of electrons. Uh, well, with Q equals CV, doesn't it? Um, so you put it into a capacitor, and you get a voltage. So the charge comes out, put it into the capacitor, you get a voltage, and you have an A to D converter which measures the voltage. Then you do it again. You clear that out and do it all again. So basically, all of these pixels come out one at a time sequentially. The great thing is that the efficiency of these can be 80-90%, so almost a perfect detector. Um, so going back, um, leaving detectors now, going back to spectroscopy, um, this is a picture of Edwin Hubble uh, on the 100-inch telescope, the Mount Wilson telescope, and this, the, the standard pictures which you've seen, but what you perhaps didn't note was he needed exposures up to 45 hours, um, and he used portrait plate cameras, uh, plate, uh, plates. So there weren't fa fancy scientific plates, there were picture plates that people took pic uh, photographs of their, their friends with, you know. They weren't cooled or anything like that. So, and they were tiny, by the way, tiny little uh, uh, plates. But obviously, if it was 48 hours, you had, you had to expose for a few hours one night, come back the next night, and then, so some of these were days of exposure. Obviously, it's not, it's nice, but never mind. Um, so, um, going back to, um, uh, this is all jumbled a bit, but never mind. Um, yeah, I don't know why we've got this. Never mind, this is basically um, uh, spectroscopy. I've said we, um, Hubble, yeah, Hubble used a, that was fine, Hubble used a very tiny prism. Um, they're not much used anymore because gratings and things like that are much more efficient. Um, so uh, the only exception to that is something like uh, an objective prism where you put in front of the telescope, remember it's a 48-inch um, Schmidt, you have a 48-inch lens at the front, 
and the, the, the mirror is 72 inches, and you put a prism uh, 48 inches across on the front of it. Uh, so every object in the field of view uh, is a little, uh, little spectrum. And I think I have brought one. Where? No, I haven't. Never mind. Um, so uh, it's quite useful for looking for, for um, new, new catalogs, new types of objects. So if you've got something which has got an emission spectrum, you can see these stick out like a sore thumb. So they're still used a bit. Um, so what else have we got? Uh, okay. Um, basically, the, the, the um, diffraction gratings haven't really changed a lot. Obviously, um, the first ones were made by Fraunhofer, but they weren't commercially available until years later. You can see here an example of a very large grating uh, worth a fortune. Um, and then some of the telescopes have got what are known as Coudé spectrographs, where you have the components of a spectrograph would fill a room this, as big as this. So you'd have a mirror right at the back, and you have an enormous grating, and it allows you to disperse the light into uh, to very high resolution, effectively. Not, not used much these days. Uh, oh, a shells, that's just... Um, forget about that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's just summarise <coughs> what's uh, been going on in, in technology in research. So, uh, photographic emulsions like 1% quantum efficiency, um, uh, photomultiplies photo in intensity, anything with a photocathode about 20%, and now CCDs 80-90%. Um, telescopes have gone from manual pointing uh, with setting circles, computer control, um, ground-based remote ones. So there are quite a lot of telescopes around uh, the world which schools and universities have access to. You just put in a proposal and, and the data comes back. Um, and there's obviously robotic ones too. And then of course there's the, the space telescopes. Uh, Hubble and now um, James West. Um, the other thing which is perhaps a bit more alarming, really, is just how the communications has changed. Um, I said this telex message came, just a sheet of paper. Um, even making a telephone call, well, even sending data from here to Australia, you had a dial-up modem with 56K, and it would go beep, 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 and the message would go, and you had to pay for an international line for half an hour, which cost a fortune, of course. Um, and, of course, um, no internet, and, of course, the other thing, no Google. I remember uh, one of my page. I was doing something, uh, trying to find something with, I think it was Mosaic was the web browser at the time, and I was trying to find something, having some difficulty, and one of my PhD students came in and said, oh, you don't want to be using that, you want to be using Google. Um, and this was when Google was two men in the garage, that the, the PhD students had logged on, uh, you know, come out across that, and of course, and nobody's turned back since then, it's just uh, amazing. So that's um, my contribution in uh, basically how, how technology has changed in, uh, in research. Let's now look at <coughs> how, it's, uh, how it's come about in, um, <coughs> in teaching. Uh, <coughs> I was employed in uh, 1979 to help start the physics of the course, because in those days um, we had a department of space research and a department of physics and the two were hardly associated. Um, <clears throat> then somebody in the administration said, well, what's the, um, what's the staff-student ratio for space research? And since we didn't have any students, the answer was not very good. <clears throat> so the powers that be suggested that physics and space research were combined and then put on this degree <clears throat> called physics and astrophysics. All the people in the um, <clears throat> uh, space research department were X-ray astronomers, so they thought they'd better have some tame, visible astronomer to come along and uh, give them some advice about that. <clears throat> uh, once the course started, it became clear to me that we couldn't really be a, a decent, um, uh, we couldn't have a decent course without an observatory. So I wrote this <clears throat> eight-page document uh, to the Senate saying um, we need to build this telescope and it'll cost us thirty thousand pounds. This is 40 years ago or something. Um, and uh, basically it was handwritten because there were no word processors. It could have been typed, but that might have taken a, a while. So it was actually it was handwritten. 
Um, let's just see. <coughs> let's just see how um, the technology was changing in, in the labs. <coughs> when I came, uh, I invented Astrolab, of course, two projects, and built the observatory. <coughs> and we realized that we needed to move away from some of these <coughs> ancient bits of kit. Um, for instance, the experiment you now do is the line spectra, the, the Riemann, uh, um, what am I trying to say, Lindbergh constant. <coughs> you use a, a spectrometer like this with a prism, and you would put a hydrogen lamp there, or a helium lamp, and you go and measure the angles, and then you'd work out, the, probably with a grating rather than a prism, and then you work out what the wavelengths were, and reading the angles with a, a vernier. <coughs> uh, all very tedious. Um, so I decided to build a, um, <coughs> a TV camera uh, spectrometer, and you can see the first one, <coughs> I mean, well actually that wasn't actually the first one, but it's, that's an enormous Hitachi camera. The previous ones were Vidicons, which were even bigger. So we have a little spectrometer and then you have this camera. <coughs> that is evolved. Um, the, the next one we made was with a, a mono uh, web camera. And eventually the, the ones that you use now, <coughs> which use a high uh, definition color camera. So that was um, something for the, for the labs. Um, th this is an ex ex example of what you can get. <coughs> the latest one allows you to see the spectrum in real time. And it also plots the, um, the intensity in real time. <coughs> so one of the students are a bit more... Uh, Pampered than they were in the past. So that's quite a nice way of doing things. Um, we also decided um, to see if we could get computers to talk to some of the experiments. And right in the centre of there's a thing called a BBC B computer. Um, and uh, I've forgotten how much memory it had, but not very much. Um, but it, it, uh, it had a programming language called BASIC, and you could actually get it to read voltages and measure them and, and, and do calculations. And this is an example of a two-beam radio interferometer looking at the sun. <coughs> so you get, uh, get fringes and uh, that's just a plot from the, uh, uh, from the BBC. In those days there were myriads of different types of PCs. There were uh, with Acorn and um, uh, obviously Apple and things like that. Um, before um, before the you know all the PC became very popular, and there were lots of different programming languages as well. Uh, but we were trying to get students to use um, computers for data acquisition. So this is one of the examples of it. Um, do you want to answer? Your... Oh, uh, this is Astrolab. Um, there was no internet, um, of course, so we wanted to do um, experiments. Um, Measuring star positions, um, things like looking for um, uh, minor planets, um, all sorts of different things. So basically what we did was we bought the Palomar Sky Survey. And you can see on the right um, the plates. And here's, here's an example of them. Um, we bought um, the whole of the Palomar Sky Survey, which cost about £20,000, £30,000. All phot photographic prints, by the way. And then we got from... Uh, uh, through the government, effectively, a similar co set for the, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the reason for seeing a picture of me there is, well, to show you the lab and then just to do a plug, because there was a video um, about that time, uh, the Sky at Night did a programme called How to Become an Astronomer, um, and Patrick Moore came and we did a, a video, and that's part of it, um, and I can give you the link if you want to have a look at it sometime. It's all a bit dated, but uh, quite amusing. So basically, we actually started. I found this thing after I'd done all of this. Um, <clears throat> so we actually, um, in the astro lab, perhaps you can pass this round. This is an example of some students measuring a, a spectrum on a light table with a telescope, with a, a microscope on an XY stage. Um, I've just been to astro lab. It's all done by magic now. Um, so, um, as I said, we, we, the point about that was we had a picture of every star and every uh, galaxy in the sky in, in at least two colours. So you can actually, the, the plates are taken through different filters, so you can actually measure how red or how blue they are, so you can work, work out things like the temperature. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, here's an experiment that we did, and um, I'll let you can pass this around because people won't believe we actually did this. Um, there's a picture of uh, 47 Tuck, which is a globular cluster. And there's a, a little reticule which I made, and we asked the students to count how many stars there were in that globular cluster uh, as a function of distance. And obviously, um, in the centre you can't count them, this, but there's too many. But um, you can count them in different radii, and of course this is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional object. So you can actually then, by plotting the uh, the density as a function of radius, you can work out what the central density is and work out how many stars are on the top of the cluster. Um, so I actually did it with real plates. The other thing we did, which is quite interesting, was in 1987, there was a supernova went off in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a couple of years later, these rings appeared around it, and what people believed had happened was there were some sheets of material, and these are light echoes. So the light has gone out at the speed of light, obviously, in a sphere, and has encountered a sheet of material, illuminated it, and then another one gone out and illuminated another there. And there was an experiment on this, that the students did with that plate uh, to find out the geometry of that. Uh, I was lucky to get that because I'd been on the staff of the AEO when they got the picture, they sent a copy of it to me. So th these were actually experiments using real material, real plates. <coughs> so, uh, let's have a look at the technolo how technology uh, changed at the observatory. We've had, we built the observatory, um, well, we, we bought a telescope. Um, I've, I've been, obviously been working with the Anglo Australian Observatory, used to having a telescope that's computer controlled. In those days, you could buy a telescope, uh, so it had the mounts, it had the gears, it had the optics, everything, but it had a synchronous motor which drove it uh, to keep it following the sun, the, the earth rather, well, I'm not saying the sky, um, and you could have another one to move it in declination, but there was no control other than that, two motors, nothing attached to it. So what we had to do was to uh, put some encoders on it which measured the position of the telescope and then uh, make some interfaces uh, which allowed the computer to uh, find out where it was and move it to where it had to be. Um, <clears throat> let's just go on to that, I think. So this is a picture of the uh, of the observatory with the original computer, and you can see halfway down on uh, on the left hand side, a black thing with lots of little keys underneath it. That was the PDP eleven, uh, and in those days they didn't even have a bootstrap, so you actually had to key in in octal one seven seven five six four or whatever the boot address was, and ask it to, to load. Underneath there were two floppy disks, uh, which had 240k each on 8-inch uh, disks, and if the temperature wasn't quite right, it wouldn't read them, it had to be 21 degrees. So, uh, that was the computer. Above it is the electronics, um, there's display showing the encoders and uh, the power from the motors, and you can see that the Terminal is what we used to call a dumb terminal. In other words, it would just uh, read or write characters. Um, so uh, that was very early on. I said it's 24k of memory. The, um, the coding which I wrote uh, was in Fortran. And if you're interested, there's the program. I found it today by chance. Um, and um, I remember being told by somebody you'll never be able to get it to go in 24K, and you won't get it to work in Fortran either. Uh, it'll have to all be done in assembler. He was nearly right, I had to write a few lines of assembler. But we got it in with 23.5K, uh, and it worked fantastically well. So, um, I should say that the code to do the driving of the telescope was mine. The, the code to do the refraction, the aberrations, all that kind of stuff, was pinched from the anglo australian observatory. Well, pinched with their, their blessing, of course. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see what we've got next. I'm losing track of where I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we first started, um, we didn't have, you couldn't buy any instrumentation, so I designed and built a, a zoom lens spectrograph. Uh, and originally, um, that was using photographic film. 
so basically you had a uh, I think I've got a picture somewhere. Uh -huh. oh, there's an image of it. Um, so the, the brown thing is the spectrograph, and the red thing is the CCD, and the big rack is um, uh, the electronics and the cooling. So basically a CCD, <coughs> there's the original CCD um, on a board. Um, I should admit that when I first made this, I made the circuit board a mirror image of it. Um, so it didn't work. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, basically the CCD is a piece of silicon, <clears throat> and at room temperature there's quite a lot of thermal electrons. So uh, in a few seconds, all of the charge sites on the CCD are filled up with electrons. So you have to cool them. And what we did was you had a Peltier device on there, which gave it a difference in temperature about 30, 30 40 degrees. <clears throat> and then we put behind that a refrigerator. Um, like a cold finger with a conventional refrigeration unit. So we got down to minus 80 degrees um, and it was in a vacuum chamber. Um, unfortunately my vacuum design wasn't very great so it had to be pumped all the time. <coughs> but it, it, it did work. I'll just pass this round here. Have a look at it. <coughs> it's, it's dead now so don't worry about it. <coughs> um, so let's see what else we've got on here. Um, Oh, there's the design of the spectrograph. So there's a, basically you have a, a slit which is tilted at 10 degrees, and the light comes through the slit from, from the star or whatever, through a collimator, onto a grating, and then um, you have three different gratings, different dispersions, and then you have a zoom lens so you can just decide how much of the spectrum you want to look at. I think I've got some pictures of that. Here's some examples. Uh, of some of the spectra we got. Um, so the top one is of a, uh, a double star, Beta Aurelia, and this is a star uh, um, <coughs> where it's, one star is going around the other, so it's uh, one part of its orbit, one's going away from you and the other's coming towards you. So you get a redshift on one and a blue of the other. The other, they're both going at right angles to your line of sight. So you can see in the bottom <clears throat> there's got two little dips, so that's the red shift of one and the blue shift of the other. So you can actually measure the orbital parameters by doing that. <clears throat> the other one uh, below it is something called a wolf ray star, um, which are massive stars. You know the sun's got a, 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 stellar, a solar wind of, of a tiny amount. Uh, these stars are super massive, they're super hot, 100, 200,000 degrees temperature. Um, and because they're so hot, they ionize the elements in the atmosphere to very high levels. So carbon-4 is actually uh, ionized three times. Carbon-3 is ionized. It's all one down. But So these are very highly ionized sets. So lots of ultraviolet. <coughs> because of the, cell, the cellar winds, these lines, which would have been narrow to start with, have been broadened because of the, the turbulence. And the other one uh, was just to show how... But it could just do something scientific. Oh, I took a spectrum of the nearest, the brightest squares are 3C273. And of course, um, it, that should be at 6563. Uh, yeah, so it's been redshifted by 0.16, and you just about see it there. <clears throat> it's not a very good spectrum because uh, we had to take quite a lot of night sky off to be able to see it. But that shows you the kind of things that students were doing you know, 20 years ago, probably. Um, using, the, using the spectrograph which we built. Um, have a look. Uh, <clears throat> this, is the, uh, uh, this is the new telescope at Wast Hills. We had a 16-inch scattergrain uh, and we got rid of that and bought a half-meter, a lunar Ritchie Cretchen telescope. <clears throat> and this is uh, got quite a lot of high-tech on it. It's, the blue thing is a beam rotator, so that, for instance, if, you want to, if you've got a galaxy, um, which is, it, here's your galaxy at some arbitrary angle on the sky, if you want to take a spectrum and your slit is, is east-west, you're only going to see a tiny bit of it. But if you've got a rotator, you can make the slit of the spectrograph go along the length of the galaxy. So you can measure the rotation of a galaxy, <coughs> because some of it will be coming towards you and the other bit will be going away. And the next thing um, we've got is a thing called a, a beam 
uh, splitter, but um, often you want more than one instrument on the back. So basically we've got an enormous, the main focus, um, we've got an enormous CCD there with a filter wheel, so we've got lots of different filters, so you can take pictures of any size you want. This is quite big, it's 35 millimetres square, so a very big bit of sky. But if you want to take a spectrum, you can put another mirror in and send the light out <coughs> to a spectrograph and take a spectrum. Or if you want to just do some lucky imaging or something, you can put another mirror in and send the light out to a, uh, a high-speed camera. <coughs> uh, <coughs> it's worth saying that um, these spectrometers which you've seen, um, <coughs> I made some of the early ones and we'd have open days and school teachers would come along and say, oh, where did you get that from? I said, oh, well, I, I designed and built it. Oh, pity you can't buy one. So I set up my own firm called Elliot Instruments and made quite a lot of them and sold quite a lot of them. And I then designed <coughs> the CCD spec, which um, is used, uh, instead of having a TV camera, it has an integrating camera on like this ATIC one. So you could, I sold quite a lot of those to amateurs for taking spectra on small telescopes. Um, <coughs> let's see what else have we got. <coughs> yeah, the, um, we started off with a PDP-11 which had 24K of memory, code written by me uh, in C. Then the PDP-11 didn't die exactly, but it was not great. So we moved it. Well, basically what we decided to do was we'll put it on a modern PC, so we thought, well, we'll try an Acorn machine, or we'll try a, uh, <coughs> a Windows machine. Um, I put the code, the Fortran code, into the uh, Microsoft uh, Fortran compiler, and I got as many errors as there were lines in the code, so 1,100 lines, 1,100 errors. The Acorn came up with three errors in one warning, so you can guess which way we went. Uh, and we just changed the bit of code and it worked. We had to have a, a, special, device, a special interface made. Uh, then, <coughs> after the acorns dis uh, disappeared, we then migrated to a Linux machine that worked for quite a long time. And then eventually we decided um, that all of my software was really out of date and we, you could then buy some commercial software which did all the singing and dancing, the procession, the notation, everything. Um, and the telescope pointing program was actually written by the guy who, uh, Patrick Wallace, who was the chief programmer at the AAT. Uh, so we bought that, and uh, then we sold the old um, Cassie Grid and bought a new Richard Cretton telescope. <coughs> so we've now got um, somebody else's software and somebody else's telescope. But it's, uh, I'm sure it's progress. Mm -hmm. So, um, in my conclusion. Uh, astronomy has been changed enormously by uh, technology over the years. I, even, you know, my lifetime has just changed from photographic film to, you know, terrible old telescopes to um, CCDs and uh, and high tech stuff. That's the point. For instance, amateurs now do with a ten inch what what Hubble did. So he's doing his redshifts with the hundred inch telescope, the biggest telescope in the world, with a photographic detector. Uh, a small telescope can do the same kind of thing. So in conclusion, i just say that um, I've been paid uh, to do my hobby for 50 years, so if you can get a job like that, I'd go for it. Okay? Thanks. <laughs> yeah? Wonderful to multiply uh, cameras. Yeah. Can you just like take off the shelf TV cameras to do that? But, or could you buy like separate ones? Uh, no, people, what people did was to buy uh, image intensifiers that have been built for the military, oh, usually, yeah. and um, do something with them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Westinghouse made them for the military, and we'd buy them and then um, either put a photographic plate on the back. I mean, usually you have a phosphor, uh, you have a um, a photocathode and then some imaging onto a phosphor screen and then you can, either, depending on how thick the phosphor screen is, you can either put a photographic plate close to it or re-image it onto, a, onto something else. But basically it's the, it's the gain of it, 
the first event is the 20% is what matters. Yeah. <clears throat> but people actually uh, used them and they had things like TV cameras looking at them. You know, um, yeah. Or you had, sometimes you had multiple of them, um, perhaps five or six um, in intensifiers one after the other. And you get a gain of hundreds of millions or something. And you can actually then see individual photons. Um, <clears throat> Noise. Well, that's the point. You do some processing. Okay. You, basically, you get when um, in a, in a image intensifier, you, you get electrons go one way, you get ions going the other way, and they bash the ions bash into the photocathode and produce splashes of light. You have to write some software to, or, or make some hardware to do it to take that out. <coughs> yeah. Which part of your career did you enjoy the most? Ooh. Oh, Anglo Australian Observatory. Um, whining and dining every night. <laughs> no, Sydney is a wonderful place to be. I had the opportunity either to go and stay in a town called Coonabarabran, um, which is next to the telescope, um, or live in Sydney. And I chose to live in um, in Avalon Beach in Sydney, um, which was very nice. Uh, basically, I mean, um, <clears throat> you had the best telescope in the world at the time, and we had people coming from all over the world, famous astronomers, saying, oh, we want to come and do this. And sometimes you had to um, nursemaid them, which is a bit of a pain, particularly with somebody very famous and who was a bit stroppy. But, uh, no, but it was just, it was fantastic, yeah. Yeah? Which one's your favourite star? <laughs> hmm, star? Um, serious, I suppose. Um, I mean, when I was a student at Manchester, <coughs> they had a, an 18-inch refractor on uh, on the Godley Observatory, which is right in the centre of town, <coughs> and I took a picture with a Godley of Sirius, and had a picture of Sirius B. Now I'll have to find the plate somewhere because it's it's ninth ninety year or something, and you you know, it's, yeah, you could just see it, which I was quite chuffed about. Really. Yeah. I have questions again. Do you know the ISO for like photographic film you use? Sorry? What's the ISO? Oh, <clears throat> that doesn't mean anything, I'm afraid. Oh, um, no, this. Yeah, <clears throat> wasn't invented then. No, no, um, no, it wasn't that. Okay. Uh, um, most films suffer from what's called reciprocity failure. Have you come yeah, across yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. So basically, reciprocity means that if you. Um, <clears throat> You assume that it, it, it works. So if you say, I'll take um, uh, a one second exposure at f10, that would be same same as a, another exposure at a different focal ratio. It doesn't work like that because um, the sensitivity depends on the rate at which the photons arrive. Yeah. So if the photons arrive very slowly, they um, hit the, the silver crystal, it becomes active and it can go back, and then it reverts. So it, it then isn't sensitive. So <clears throat> so one of the things about the film using the, um, uh, putting hydrogen and things into the uh, uh, into the, the, the uh, plates was to get rid of reciprocity failure. You got rid of the yeah. of the <clears throat> compounds which saved it, gave it shelf life basically. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you normally get like a finer grain software with um, lower isotherm. Well, yeah, no, these were very coarse film. The, these, um, the film I used was 103 AE mostly, which or 098 something, and they had um, the pics. Well, the uh, uh, the grains were 25 microns, enormous. Okay, yeah. So if you if you look at a, uh, a picture taken on those plates, they're really very coarse grain. Yeah, and then they were developed in the most caustic, dangerous um, developer, the most active developer you get. So you'd have to get every little you know, nuance out of it if you could. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we used to buy um, the observatory when we first, uh, we didn't have a CCD. We used to use 103 AE film, and it came from the States in a um, 100 foot of 35 millimeter film. And it was stored in the fridge all the time. So it was stored in the fridge, then you cooked it. You know, you couldn't make it up. Um, when I say we put, um, you might think this hydrogen business was actually quite dangerous. You actually use what's called forming gas, which is actually, I think it's 92% nitrogen and 8% hydrogen. Um, so it's less likely to blow up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. 
So there was a bit of chemistry going on as well. But, uh, no, I mean, I think um, things like the, um, well, uh, the moment when I took the pick plate out of the, the, pl uh, out of the fixer for that uh, Vila Sivanova run, it's just phenomenal. So. And I basically, when I, I did, I did that for a month, and every day there was somebody coming saying, "What have you done today? Can you take a picture of this one?" Um, because we went from twenty minutes to five hours. The interesting thing was, <clears throat> nobody had ever taken an exposure so long, and you had to be careful about. Um, it was possible to change the polar axis of the of the Schmidt telescope because you wanted the polar axis to be pointed not at the true pole. But the refracted pole, so where where the where the telescope thinks the pole is, and to minimise the um, <clears throat> you get uh, this you get little star trails. It's a bit like if your telescope isn't at the pole star. Uh, well, you've seen now Tazimuth now Tazimuth telescope, the field rotates once a day. Yeah, so you have to turn that round, and it's the same basically with a <clears throat> an equatorial telescope. If you're not quite aligned. You get a, a tiny curve, yeah. Which you don't obviously don't want. Do you use something like um, is this like King's Fusion or something like that? Uh, it's got like Sidery or track it, we've got King. I've never heard of it even. Oh, okay. No, 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 I did. No. And basically, the the UK Schmidt, <clears throat> they had a, a, another telescope on the side, six or eight inch refractor, and they had a, an auto guider, <clears throat> which wasn't the, it wasn't a. Uh, it wasn't a CCD, it was um, basically a scanning photomultiplier. You had a, um, uh, you had, had something which looked at the, the signal by moving with a magnetic field, the beam backwards and forwards, yeah? And you got a profile in X and Y. And then the, the, um, the, the electronics, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't software control, it was electronically controlled, uh, point of the telescope. So. Any other questions? Are you happy to stick around uh, at the end? Of course, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's some there's some archival stuff here if you want to have a look. There's some pictures of building in the observatory. There's the um, the design of the CCD camera, um, and there's some there's my Fortran code for driving the task. All found by chance today um, when we're having a clear eyes. Okay. Thank you.